Good morning, friends. It is so good to be with you. I always love coming to Williams to see my friends here. Um, and I am so thankful for you. You know, it's been a while since I've been here. It is about time for me to be back. Let us not wait this long again, okay? Um, I love coming here, and I want to thank you. I don't know that you guys know this, but this year, 2017, is the most that your church has given to Alabama CBF and CBF ever. You guys have done an amazing job, and I love, I did not know you were showing this video this morning with Jade and Sheila Acker, who are from Alabaster, Alabama, and who are part of our Alabama CBF um, budget. We give to all of the field personnel that come from Alabama, and so they're in our plan, and I've just got to think, wow, I didn't know you were going to show that video, which is about refugees, and today our scripture talks about when Mary and Joseph had to flee with baby Jesus and became refugees, so that's amazing. And But you know what? I did not know about the Christmas suit. <laughs> so, Nikki, I've got money for your global <laughs> missions offering. One... We want to support Global Missions. That's incredible. I love that Jacob and Esau didn't know that their names came from the Bible, which means that somewhere their parents had heard the story of Jesus in Bible stories and knew about Jacob and Esau, but that they found their way to Refuge and Hope, which is incredible. So I want to give to Global Missions offering, but also, guys, we got to get Chris in that Christmas suit. <laughs> And will you post that on Facebook so I can see it? That's, that's amazing. Okay. Today, our passage of Scripture does come to us from Matthew chapter 2. And I would love for you to read that along with me. I'll read it to you from my Bible. But if you want to follow along, we're going to be verses 13 through 23. This is what happens after the wise men have come and brought gifts to baby Jesus. But if you will remember, they went to Herod first to find out about Jesus, clued him into this story. And we know that Herod was a king that had lots of fears about maintaining his power in the world. And this is what happens. Now, after the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was furious. And he sent and killed all of the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. Let us pray together. God, we love you. And we are so glad to be together this morning in this place, worshiping you as a family of people united by Jesus. God, we are aware that this scripture is a difficult one for us to hear. So we pray that you will open our hearts and open our minds 
to hear a word from you this day that transforms our lives with you and the way that we share the love of Jesus with others. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. This year, I managed to lose Jesus. On the first Sunday of 2017, I was actually invited to preach a sermon at a church, and this was the scripture passage. So it happened to actually land in January of this year. And so we had already, the day before, on Saturday, packed up all of our Christmas. And so we had taken down the tree, and we had packed up the nativity scene from our house. So I had taken Jesus out of the nativity scene box because I wanted to take Jesus with me to the church to preach the sermon about Jesus is with us, which is the title of the sermon today. So I took baby Jesus. We preached the sermon. Jesus was with us in the church on the pulpit. After church, I took baby Jesus and put Jesus in my pocket and took Jesus home. Well, we had already packed up the nativity scene. It was down in the basement, and so I thought... I don't really want to walk down to the basement right now to put baby Jesus back with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men. So I'm going to put Jesus someplace safe where I'll remember where Jesus is. And I do not know what happened to Jesus. So we have been searching for baby Jesus the entire Advent season. Well, I wasn't very concerned at first because we know that Jesus doesn't arrive actually in the nativity scene until he's born at Christmas. And I just knew we would find Jesus somewhere in the house. Alas, I truly lost Jesus. I don't know what happened to Jesus. I am sure that Someday, I will be doing something in my home, and we will find baby Jesus. But I told this story on Facebook about losing Jesus this year, and people have been very concerned. (laughs) So last week, a friend posted, have you found Jesus yet? And I said, no. Sadly, baby Jesus is still lost. And I had another friend from church who saw that and called me and said, I have found you, Jesus. She has a friend who owns a Christmas shop. It's already closed. But she wanted to make sure that I didn't go an entire year without Jesus, the presence of Jesus in my life. And so they opened up the holiday shop and allowed me to go and get Jesus, put him in the manger with Mary and Joseph where he belongs and so thankfully Jesus has been found and is in his proper place or at least what we like to think of maybe as his proper place but the reality is in our life by the way I brought my husband Paul with me today So in our life, it was not unusual for Jesus to go missing from the nativity scene. Because you see, when the children were little, I would walk past the nativity scene and look into the stable and discover that baby Jesus was missing from the manger. So I would call out, has anybody seen baby Jesus? And always a little voice would respond, I have Jesus. Jesus is with me. And I would walk down the hall following the sound of the little voice to find that Evan had Jesus in her doll cradle with the other babies. Or that Turner had Jesus in the Batmobile or simply in his pocket while he was playing in the room. I do remember vividly at the time, the very first time I heard Turner, who was our eldest, call out, I have Jesus. Jesus is with me. How 
comforting that was to me because Turner is our Christmas baby. And the year that he was born, I had lost my mother from cancer. And I remember how sad I had been, but that the day that Turner was born in December, that I remembered that we also call Jesus Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And that's how I felt when Turner was born, was that Jesus had not forgotten me, that God was with me. And here he had brought new life into our home and that he was fully present in my sorrow and fully present in my joy. Somehow, this year when I lost Jesus, thinking that I had put him somewhere safe, I was reminded that sometimes we have very difficult years and things happen that are full of sorrow and we may not be able to see Jesus or feel Jesus or realize where he is at a time when we feel like we need him the most. And yet, he is still present. I've overheard several people say that they are ready for this year to end. It seems that we've lost a lot of people this year. Those we've never met and those who are close to us. Some, very tragically, in events we can't even begin to wrap our minds around. There is discontent and division among us. Violence around the world and violence at home anger and frustration bubbling over in ways that keep us apart rather than binding us together. Is there any peace, any comfort, any hope to be found? This past week, we have been reminded through the Jesus story that God truly became flesh and lived among us full of grace and truth. It's a reality that changes everything. But there are truths to that reality that we sometimes overlook or that really don't seek in until we come face to face with them, like in our scripture for today. My best friend's son, by the way, my children are now grown and in their 20s, and Turner's best friend is a guy named William Scruggs who is now an associate editor at Smith & Helwes, which produces the Formation Sunday School material. I don't know if any of you use that. I see some nods. Um, but last year, he wrote an editorial at this time, and it was on the Smith & Helwes website, and the editorial was called, God is Born and Don't Own a Car. For those of you who know Jimmy Buffett well, it's referencing a Jimmy Buffett song. William reflects on the reality that God chose to be born not in Rome or even in Jerusalem, not to a royal family or a family with wealth, but rather to a poor family, tired young parents from a small town living under a tyrant king. Humanity has spent much of its history trying to overcome its limitations, William wrote, and God, who is already transcendent, chose to live with all of the challenges that accompany our human condition. And that condition includes deep sorrow and suffering. Our scripture today details the massacre of the innocents, the holy family, fleeing from their lives to another country and becoming refugees, and the reminder of Rachel weeping for her children. It's one of those times that causes us to ask, is God real? Is God good? And if so, why is there such great suffering in the world? Where is God in the midst of extreme sorrow? My husband Paul has been a pediatric chaplain for 25 years. 
Even though he never tells us names, he will sometimes share stories from his work. There is a story that he told me 20 years ago that has stayed with me over the years. One of our friends at the time, who was a nurse and worked at the Children's Hospital, also shared with me how Paul was present in the story, and the story revisits my soul every time I read this passage that we have today. Paul was covering a night shift at All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida, where we lived before we moved to Alabama, when he received an urgent call from a nurse's station. A young boy had died, and his mother was inconsolable. Paul rushed up to the floor to discover the mother wailing in grief. Like a wounded animal, she had fallen to the floor and writhed in the pain of her loss. Nurses, doctors, a security guard, and others were trying to get her up off the ground and to quiet her, shushing her like a guardian angel. Paul ran into the situation asked them gently if they would back away from her, and then knelt over her, whispering words of comfort into her ear and prayers. And then he stood over her and gave her space while she grieved. Once everyone moved away and stopped rushing around trying to end the wailing, In the silence of that night ward, her weeping echoed through the halls, and a holy hush descended. And doctors and nurses and others lent their tears to her pain. Rachel is weeping for her children and will not be consoled because they are no more. We've all seen the videos from Syria and Africa and Sudan of mothers and fathers weeping for their children who have been killed. Rachel is weeping for her children and will not be consoled for they are no more. We have seen the images of schools and churches, places we thought were safe, where violence has intruded and people stand outside huddled together in grief. Rachel is weeping for her children and will not be consoled, for they are no more. As a minister, I would rather end the Christmas story with the exotic and adoring magi on bended knee bearing extravagant gifts, but not Matthew. In this gospel, Matthew reminds us of this part of the story. Dr. David Luz, a theologian and president of Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, writes that Matthew tells a story that is grittier, more disturbing, but also more ultimately realistic than the other Gospels. And perhaps that's the main value of reading and telling this story so close to Christmas. Dr. Luz reminds us that Jesus' birth upset the order of his day. He comes as God's chosen king, the one who is to bring about peace and justice and equality and equity in the kingdom of God. And so all earthly kings who put their own power and privilege first, are terrified. Herod is a good but not the only example of this in this time in the world. So terrified is Herod of the promise that God will, in this child, restore peace and justice, that he is willing to slaughter the infants of an entire region. So Joseph, warned by an angel, flees this carnage and moves his family to Egypt. Such a grim account of wholesale massacre and night flights to safety would seem far-fetched were it not for similar atrocities and tragedies happening right now. 
How many families, for instance, like Jacob and Esau, are dislocated from war-torn countries even as we gather this morning for worship? And how many children are being starved to death around the world even as we throw away our holiday leftovers? And how many families, maybe some even in our own congregation today, are suffering their own private sorrows and hardships only to be exasperated maybe by the expectations of a joyful Christmas? So while the story Matthew tells may be dark and difficult, it even isn't even a little far-fetched for us, which is why, of course, he tells it, to remind us that even when we can't find God, God is still present with us. To let us know that in Jesus, Emmanuel, God did indeed draw near to us, took on our life and experienced and endured all that we do. Disappointment, fear, violence, and even death. Also that we would know that we are not alone. We are not alone. We do not suffer alone. We do not fear alone. We do not live or die alone. If anything, this is Matthew's version of the Incarnation Part 2. We get the obedient young couple, the angels and the shepherds, and a precious baby in a manger. All of that joy, but we also get suffering and weeping. Sometimes life is beautiful and filled with goodness and grace. And God is a part of every moment of that, giving blessing and celebrating with us and for us. And sometimes life is hard and gritty and disappointing and filled with heartache. And God is a part of that as well, holding on to us, comforting us, blessing us with the promise that God will stay with us through every moment of today and of tomorrow, drawing us ever more deeply into his embrace and promising us, promising us that nothing, not even death, will separate us from God. So on this brink of a new year, where do we even begin? Maybe first with permission to will to God with our deepest sorrows and disappointments. Prayers of lament and sadness are still prayers. Our cries to God are not only heard, but are held gently with reference by a God who loves us more than we could ever imagine. The Jesus introduced to us by Matthew here is the same Jesus who weeps with Mary on the road to Lazarus' tomb and weeps with you and I still today. Second, our grief is not for us alone. In her book, The God-Bearing Life, Kenda Creasy Dean reflects that Mary, the mother of Jesus, as the Christ-bearer, not only ponders in her heart all that she has seen and experienced through her child, but also becomes in herself the bearer of joy and sorrow that she carries and that he carries as her child. As followers of Jesus, Christ bearers in our world today, we can live out the call that Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians, one of my favorite passages of scripture, which says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our every distress so that we can comfort those who are also in distress with the comfort that we ourselves have known and experienced that we have received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also we must share abundantly the comfort that we have found through Christ Jesus. 
we do not walk our paths of sorrow so that we experience them privately. We walk them so that as we learn and grow and experience the comfort that Jesus provides for us, then we can be that for others as well. It is into our real world, both beautiful and broken, that our Jesus moves into, moves into the neighborhood, to be near to us, not distant. Pope Francis, who I follow on Twitter, by the way, recently tweeted, God, who is in love with us, draws us to himself with his tenderness by being born poor and frail in our midst as one of us. I have good news for you, my friend, in the middle of this sad story. God is with us, holding us through the joys and sorrows, working through the triumphs and tragedies that we experience, and sharing with us the salvation that brings hope, the hope that Nikki was talking about this morning with our children, through life and death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This story matters because it tells us the truth, that sometimes difficult truth of unjust rulers and violence and private grief and personal pain and all of the rest, but also the always hopeful truth that God has not stood back at a distance, but in Jesus has joined God's own self to our story and is working even now, even here, to grant us new life that we may not just endure, but that we may flourish, experiencing resurrection joy and courage in our daily lives and sharing the hope of that with others. Jesus is with me, not today in my pocket or sitting on the pulpit or even just in the nativity scene at home. Jesus is with me, even when I can't see him or feel him. And Jesus is with you, with all of us. So as we step forward into the rest of today, and especially tomorrow, into a bright new year, let's carry the love and hope of Jesus with us. And not only carry it with us, but be the presence of Jesus in our world, and to all of the people that we come in contact with, in the very best ways that we know how, to a world that so desperately needs him. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful to be in your presence this day, to know that when we are gathered together, that you are here And we are not alone. Transform us by your hope and by your love. Amen.